Hi, y'all. I'm Atticus, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore and the host for tonight's event. This evening, we are pleased to welcome Robin Kerman and Elisa Albert to our At Home with Literati series in support of The End of Getting Lost. For our attendees, the chat is closed, but I will be dropping links to purchase The End of Getting Lost throughout the event. You can also use the Q&A feature to submit questions at any time. A reminder that you can shop for more books in store or at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup and shipping to your home anywhere in the United States. And now let me introduce tonight's author and moderator. Robin Kerman studied philosophy at Yale before receiving her MFA in writing from Columbia University, where she also taught for several years. Her curiosity about human psychology has led her to combine work in psychoanalysis with writing fiction. Her first novel, Bradstreet Gate, was published by Crown in 2015, and her television series, The Love Wave, is currently in development. Elisa Albert is the author of Afterbirth, The Book of Dahlia, How This Night is Different, and the editor of an anthology, Freud's Blind Spot. Her fiction and nonfiction has appeared in Tin House, New York Times, Post Read, The Guardian, Gulf Coast, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, to, just to name a few. She grew up in Los Angeles and received an MFA from Columbia University. A recipient of the Moment Magazine Emerging Writer Award and a finalist for the Sammy Rohr Prize, Sammy Rohr Prize at the Tongue Twister. Um, she's received fellowships from the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, Degrassi, um, Vermont Studio Center, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies in Holland, the HWK in Germany, and the Amsterdam Writers Residency. She lives with her family in upstate New York. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Robin and Elisa. Thanks. I am humbled by your intro, Lisa. <laughs> wow. That was a lot. You should just be humbled by my humanity. Awesome. I'm humbled by your humanity. <laughs> Hello. I'm <laughs> Zooming from the Hippie Mental Hospital, AKA Kripalu Center for Yoga and Meditation, hence the mandalas behind me and the institutional lighting. Where are you Zooming from? A corner of my living room. I have a plant and I have a screen. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. And your book came out two days ago, three days ago? Tuesday. Yeah. Happy birthday to your book. Thank you. Thank you. It's pretty awesome. There she is. Could not stop reading it. Oh, thank you. Really appreciate that. Hitchcockian. <laughs> it's like a, <laughs> it's like the lost Patricia Highsmith novel. That's, that would be my dream. It's going to be a great movie. It's very cinematic. Yes. I mean, you can ask me about that later if you want, because I, I have a couple of things to say, if you feel like it. Um, no, fuck it. I don't want to hear from you at all. I just want to talk <laughs> to you. Don't you love conversations where uh, the ostensible interviewer is just like telling the subject like what they think? I just saw one of those where I was like, can you just let the other person talk? Robin, hi, how are you? Tell me, tell me what's up. I'm good. I'm, should I start with a little passage before we get into your talking at me or my talking at you? Hopefully the latter. Okay, let's do it. So um, it's, I just, I thought it's a little tricky with the suspense novel. Um, I either have to choose a passage that's very unsuspenseful or give stuff away. So what I'm doing is something that is very early. Um, and just gives you maybe a little flavor of what's to come. Um, so I guess you just need to know that um, Duncan and Gina are on holiday. She has had an accident. She's disoriented. She doesn't quite know what she remembers, what she doesn't. Um, and yet there's something sort of blissful and, and, um, and unsettling at the same time about these two being in this remote, at this point, um, Swiss, kind of a uh, cottage. Okay. Around six, they started getting ready. Duncan, Duncan whistled as he dressed in a yellow linen suit that he'd gotten before they left Zurich. He hadn't brought many clothes with him on the trip, preferring to travel light, picking up when he needed it as they went. Gina put on a blue dress, then searched for this silk satchel that contained her jewelry. Inside, there wasn't much, a pair of diamond earrings that she'd received from her grandparents at her high school graduation, 
an anklet she'd bought in college on a trip into the city with her best friend Violet. Her most cherished piece was a ring she'd been given by her mother, a yellow stone, not precious, but exotic. It had functioned as an engagement ring until Duncan could afford a proper one. What little money they had had, they'd spent on simple bands. Hers hung a little loosely on her finger, she'd noticed. Apparently she'd lost some weight from the stress her injury had caused her. Feeling around in the satchel for her mother's ring, she found a chain caught among some threads at the bottom. She pulled it out, a silver bracelet with a turquoise stone at the center. It must be from her father or other family in Santa Fe, she thought, but when she turned the piece over, she noticed an inscription on the back, for my love. Did you give this to me, she asked Duncan, thinking that he knew her taste too well to choose a piece that was so bland. He laid the bracelet in his palm and took note of the inscription. It's from an aunt of yours, some sort of family heirloom. Could she have forgotten such a thing? She felt a moment of unease at her failure to recall, but told herself not to dwell on such details. Did she really need to know the story behind every small object in her possession, the countless bits of information that we all carry with us and let shape in some cluttered and arbitrary way our sense of who we are? There was something freeing and forgetting she'd discovered, as if all these tiny accretions were like layers of clothing that kept you from feeling the air, the night, the life that was cloaked around you. She looked over at Duncan, seeing him almost freshly then, with the years together stripped away, revealing the qualities she loved in him, his gentleness, his intelligence, his delicate dark features and the green eyes that always had a slightly distracted look about them, like he was listening to some inner song only he could hear. He turned to take her arm then, and she stepped out into the cool Swiss evening with the sound of crickets and lapping water and a man beside her with a mild voice and smiling face who'd stood by her and loved her since she was 19. I did not see any of this coming. <laughs> the twists I'm, and turns. I'm glad. Wow. I had to go back to the beginning at the end and then like re-experience it knowing what I knew. That's so nice because you're a really sharp lady. So, you know, you never know when you're writing this stuff and you know the answers, what people will anticipate. Did you know the answers when you started? I, mean, I basically, you know, you don't know everything, right? I, I had some of the major shifts in mind and then you invent little things. But I think it's such a delicate balancing act because you can't spring stuff on a reader. They want to feel that they've been given sort of a fair chance to solve in this kind of a book. You know, you have to kind of drop clues but everyone is trying to figure it out, right? You drop too many clues, it becomes obvious. So it's kind of a trick. Um, and, and I was always wondering if I was getting it right. I don't think you ever know. And, you know, no two readers are the same. So for some people it might feel like it was somewhat obvious. I mean, there are a few things. There's no one thing, right? Along right. the way. Um, Did you have it all mapped out? At, from the outset or was it was there a process of discovery in terms of the major in terms of like did you know where it was headed did you know like what happened I knew I think I knew the major turns what I didn't entirely know I mean first of all all, all the small stuff and who exactly they are and how exactly they lie and why yeah. and the relationships and how stuff comes out you can't possibly write until you sit down to write um I didn't know where things were going to fall and I find that when you're doing, you know, just a simply literary book that doesn't have as much suspense, you're under less pressure to kind of figure out there's something about the chronology with these and the sort of heightened sense of things. It can make you kind of anal because if you move stuff around, yeah. it's just a very different experience. Um, so deciding to where to reveal and what to reveal I played with in, uh, in revision. And um, was the con were the conventions of this kind of thriller uh, familiar to you already? Was it something you sort of always wanted to explore or try out? You know, it's funny. I don't know. I don't think so. Although I love I love um, Highsmith, and I do love in film. I love Hitchcock and and these sort of you know twisty plots. Um, I think to be perfectly frank, on my first novel, I got accused of having a lot of like. There was a lot of suspense and, and page turning, but people weren't really gratified with the ending. And I had done a lot of kind of literary digressions and character building and so on. And 
I had this sense that I wanted to prove that I could craft a plot. You I think know? you did. I think you what? proved it. Mission accomplished. <laughs> And it, you know, it's a different kind of writing when you're thinking so much about plot. I think there's a way in which we, you know, we went got our MFA together. And I think in school, plot is almost a dirty word. Oh yeah, yeah. Right? It is. And then you get into the world and readers, there are a lot of readers who really, really want a strong plot and will be very angry if they don't get it. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a test, I guess, for me to figure out if I could do it. Interesting. Well, you passed with flying colors, I would say, my humble opinion. We'll see. Have you, by any chance, seen the um, huge doorstop volume of Highsmith's journals, like her, her from like 1940 to her death? It's right. wild. It's, she, it's really... she looks fascinating, difficult. I mean. Oh yeah, I mean, and she's one of those people, like so many, whose sort of late life political opinions just torpedoed her reputation. Um, very common. Strange. Anyway, I highly recommend it. It's a really, it's not. I think there were a lot of issues now. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> I'm still in like 1941. So I only know the vague outlines, but I'm curious to follow it through. It's not like a, it's a, it's a dip in every now and again, kind of book. It's not a bedside read. I mean, it's like yeah. 15 pounds. It was going to be my winter project, but I'm still in 1941. You have so much it's more patience than I do. But I will say that The Talented Mr. Ripley, both the book and the film are just so well done. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think the film, I'm, I'm doing an adaptation now, so I'm thinking about filmic adaptations and I think the film capitalizes so well on what film can do, but also the book is so riveting and so well done. So that was one of the biggest influences um, when I was writing, I read that book. And you, you'll see if you, if you were to read them side to side, the way I played with the letters and some of the other communication elements I lifted is strong, but it was heavily influenced. Inspired. That's, inspired. that's totally kosher. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah. We, we yeah, pay sure. homage, you know, she did it too. And whoever, whoever she was taking from did it too, all the way back to like the first cave handprint, I think. Yeah, I'm sure it's true, but um, it was a wonderful book and it was, it was really helpful to me. Um, in your adaptation, um, how are you dealing with time? I was thinking about that while I was reading. I'm so curious. It's really hard to adapt. You know, I've done some screenplay work before a little bit, and this is 10 times harder. I think having, you know, the knowledge of the book, the way that I do, if I were coming from it, this is probably obvious, but if I were coming from it, you know, from a distance, I wouldn't want to sort of bring in all these things necessarily the source material and I'd be more distant. Um, they're so it is such a different animal and there's so much you have to rethink and there's so much you have to lose and i think it's impossible to tell the story without some of their past mm -hmm. but you're going to get a lot less so it's going to be a very different experience you need you need uh blake and violet in college you need like the seed of their relationship right <laughs> what happens <Lisa? laughs> I'm so curious to see. I, there's there's certain market constraints, and um, you know it's oh, yeah. being built as a thriller. If you saw any of the releases, and thrillers, you know they they keep up a pace. And this book kind of it takes its time for you know for the you know it, it's sort of in between genre. I think it has a lot of you know literary features, including that it's not in a tremendous hurry and spends a lot of time developing these characters yeah. um, to make this suspense you know, from my point of view, kind of like hooked onto something and meaningful, yeah. but you, you're going to lose a lot of that in the movie. You just, you hope you get stuff back from the actors. Um, well, that's why movies are not a substitute for books. I mean, they're just different animals and they scratch different itches and they serve different purposes. And, yeah. you know, if there's, I mean, we all have the experience of loving a book and the movie's just irrelevant to us, you know, on that level. It might be relevant on a different level, but it's not remotely the same. And then the opposite where there's like a shitty book, but the movie's great. Right. I mean, if we were not talking about my book, I'd talk about The Lost Daughter because I know you read it. But the lo I haven't seen the movie. I okay. I, I'm, I refuse to see it because the book is so dear to me. But so, I hear it's good. It is good and it would be interesting because I saw the movie and didn't read the book. And so we would have different ideas, but um, it might be very hard to watch if you had read the book. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll just wait until I've 
you know, maybe I'll forget the book in a few more years. Maybe I, I read it like maybe five, six years ago. So maybe, maybe like another couple of years and I can just see the movie and not, not connect it to the book, you know? I mean, I'm having just, to go to the, you know, from my book, like in order to reconceive it as a film and it's not that easy. Well, and film is so collaborative. Writing is so solitary and you're really the end all be all of that world and in film. Yeah, no. I was going to say about the intersection, though, it's interesting. Um, I thought of this as a movie first. Mm. Think, you know, I was thinking of transitioning um, into screenwriting for economic reasons, among others, <laughs> time management reasons. Economic reasons. Yeah. And I saw this as a movie. And I think that part of what you're reacting to when you say that it has cinematic qualities really does stem from the fact that I really thought this is, this can be a movie. Um, and the, the genesis of the film deal also stems from that because what happened was I wrote it as a novel for various reasons, not the least of which I didn't know how to write a movie. <laughs> and, um, and I didn't know anyone. But by the time it was done, I had started to learn and I, and I had actually optioned this script yeah. And so the, it was Dakota Johnson's company that was developing the love wave and they, my agent, my film agent, whose book to film sent it to them. And so that's why we got this weird arrangement where the book hadn't even come out yet. And I'm a nobody. Um, and yet it's, it's being made. Come now, come now. What well, is I mean, you know, either they'll pick up a bestseller or they'll pick up a famous writer sort of ahead of the, the release. No, I think, isn't that usually how? I don't know. I mean, I want to see into talking about your psychoanalytic work and I'm, I'm just, I'm just tripped up by, by you calling yourself a nobody, but we can revisit that later. Maybe in Hollywood. You are somebody. Okay. <laughs> oh, therapy session. Well, I, I guess Hollywood sometimes makes you feel like that. Yeah, that's why Hollywood's fucking stupid. Don't yeah. tell them I said that. I'm, you didn't hear from me. <laughs> but I got very lucky because the producer gave it straight to um, Paul Meskel and Margaret Qualley and they they loved the book and that was it. I mean, I didn't have to really scramble. Like or dream role for a young actress, I would, I I would imagine. It's, really, it's, you know, Gina's a really, I mean, they're both, they're both good roles. And there's, you don't have that many young women that are that complicated. <sighs> Duncan's a good role. Violet's a good role. Blake's a good role. They're all, it's so good. It's just, it's great. It's like a page turner. I really wanted to know what happened. Yeah, you know. <laughs> you did a great job. It like, it holds water, you know, it right. functions. It's like a, it's like a well-functioning machine. I appreciate it's, that. Yeah. These things can be kind of unforgiving, right? This. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially like you said, this, this genre. You know, sure. if the dots don't connect, then, yeah. you know, and you're, it's like a fine line you're walking, I think, with yeah. suspense. Yeah, it is fun, though. There was something enjoyable in, in the game aspect of it that I have to say I do like. But what we were the mechanics? Have... What were you saying? What were the mechanics? Like, how did you, like, mechanically, practically, like, did you... Did you outline? Did you have a room full of index cards? Like, what was your process? I outline a little bit. I mean, I, frankly, I don't even remember so well. I think a lot of it happened as I was writing and then I would maybe come back and connect things after the fact. And I outlined some things for sure. Um, I've always, I don't know if you remember from school, but I've always had a little part of me that likes kind of games and puzzles in writing. I mean, I don't play games and puzzles, but you know, that I, there's something that I enjoy about the kind of click, 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 I, I can find that really fun. So it, it was sort of an opportunity to, to use that and then also combine it with the sort of character building, right. world building side of things. You're like an architect here, almost. Like, I, find that, I find that fun. Yeah. Good. Somebody's got to. <laughs> I don't know so if I'd want to do it on every project, but I also think in film writing, there's a lot of that. The architecture is key. Sometimes the dialogue is crap, but the architecture has to be good or, you know. Right, you know, right. Do you, right. Want you don't really need the dialogue to be good because the visual is carrying you through. And the actors, if they're good enough, they can sort of say anything. Totally. Forgive so much in that medium that you just don't forgive on the page at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if writing, if, if, if writing is, uh, if novel writing is so much more difficult than 
precise and complex then why do screenwriters get paid like a hundred times more than we do baby is it like the less difficult the job I, mean, I won't say it's paid? difficult you know the I, th I think the development process is not easy. I think there's a lot of stop and start. I'm so new to it that I'm, you know, probably speaking, you know, as a, I am speaking as a total novice here, but I think a lot of projects got kill get killed. A lot of people get kicked off of things. And also it's just, it's just the, they make so much compared to what they pay the writer. The writer is yeah, the so writer's incidental. The writer could like it really like it could just be AI sometimes. Like I, I and I and I think you know compared to the money that's at stake, it's a lot compared to novels. But it's just it's just audience. It's just market forces. There's just you know when this release came out, the amount of sort of pickup and viewership compared to a book review, it's just you know it's it's night and day. Mm -hmm. There's just so many people watching. Um, tell me about the. Um... The process like what were you doing what was going on in your life while you were writing this what was your you know what was what was your routine how did it go was it very like even and linear or what i'm seeing patients so i'm not going to get too personal <laughs> in case because this is public record but um not that anything so well is going on um i was i think i was starting psycholinic training I wrote this fairly quickly. I had started writing quickly. I used to write incredibly slowly. And I think my process had become, um, don't second guess myself, just just go, just, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I didn't do a hell of a lot of revising. Um, and I finished a draft fairly quickly. And then I did sort of a second round when I gave it to my agent and we got a little feedback and I, and I built up some of the, some of the history and some of the characters more because they wanted like a, a little bit more of a character, you know, it had been more, a little bit more of a thriller and they wanted a little more character building. Mm -hmm. So then I did that. Um, I read a lot, at least, so you know me, I mean, I, I'm kind of a workaholic. So I, I just tend to write whenever I can. And while, while the impulse is kind of with me, mm -hmm. um, and where it came from, I had been living abroad and then I came back and I, I think there was something about, and I'd had some romantic turmoil, <laughs> which is probably can be inferred. Um, so I think I, this novel was a way of kind of coming home and, and also settling myself with this material, kind of, you know, bringing the abroad experience with me. I also did a lot of traveling when I was younger, but this, I sort of came to rest and um, and felt like wanting, I felt like I wanted to write something about the disorientation of being abroad and, and also of having relationships abroad. When you're away from family, you're away from, you know, your natural context and your friends and the people that know you, um, I think different things happen. You know, there is a way in which, I mean, getting lost is in the title. There is a, you know, I, I was thinking and I, and I feel that you can get lost traveling. It's totally disorienting. You, you know, you can, you can sort of cut your sense. You can get dizzy traveling, right? Just sort of wind up on the other end of the earth and just mm -hmm. in a way, lose yourself in a good way too. And in love, you can lose yourself. So I was playing with that. I, it was kind of an experience where, you know, you could see the head injury if you want a little bit metaphorically as just massive disorientation. Mm -hmm. Um, none of this story could happen if anyone were home for a million reasons. Right. right. So totally. I think, I think it was a way of processing what it felt like to lose myself a little bit in the years that I was traveling in a good and in a bad way. Um, but just to, you know, break the, break the familiar, break the parameters of who I had been. Mm -hmm. in some ways. Makes sense. That's so interesting, but thank God you never got kidnapped by an obsessed that lover did you <laughs> Robin, is this book autobiographical <laughs> it's not but I, I I borrow from life you know like we all do so we maybe we had some emotional experience yeah sure yeah. sure sure um, yeah yeah fascinating fascinating of course they went to Yale so <laughs> Oh, I just do that by default because I just know what it looks like. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's like stuff 
I feel like whatever one is writing, there's stuff you're interested in making up. And then there's stuff that you just like, why, like, don't bother. Like, you know, it's just not where the heat is. So just make it something familiar, you know? I also thought, you know, they had, they have a good arts department there. Um, and it's plausible she could be a dancer and then he, you know, it just, why not? But it's not, it's not important. I loved her backstory too. I mean, I love the Santa Fe and the, and the mom and that whole, the, you know, the art teacher mom and the tragic, I won't give it away. Yeah. It's a can- tragedy. She's the got dad, it. the painter who has no success, but he just like lives for it. So that's what he does. Santa Fe was really vivid. Yeah. And New York in the yeah. 90s was really vivid. <laughs> what? I've never been to Santa Fe. Really? I would like to be. I just went for the first time last couple months ago. I have, a, I have an idea that I think we all do. You know, I think you captured it. I was obsessed yeah. with it. I wanted to see it so bad. And I went and it was amazing. Yeah, I just, I, I wanted something that was sort of a contrast, I guess, for her, you know, there's a, there's oh, yeah. a kind of like the light and, the, and there's a utopia, she has a kind of utopian history that goes very much wrong and, and tragic, and Duncan has sort of the opposite, he's in sort of a, a crappy Jersey town, and, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's a confined childhood, you kind of picture her somehow outside and yes. for him kind of stuck in a room. Yes expansive um, and contracted and yeah. like and yeah. she's so open and trusting and she's and like you can just see how she she wasn't prepared for like the harsh mm-hmm. world the cold um you know psychotic jewish stalker she wasn't prepared for that <laughs> well, <Don't> I, mean, <laughs> but. I mean in a way she was, in a way she wasn't, because she's got her own lunacy. Um, but I really enjoyed writing the backstories because I, you know, I, I said this with on my on my last one of these, but um, you know, there, there's always a question about whether to include backstory. Sometimes people just write it to give themselves the idea of the character, and then they decide it's right. not really necessary. But right. I, I here I found it really fun because they do such crazy stuff to give a backstory that to me grounded what mm-hmm. they do and what they do it. So it felt important for Gina, for instance, the fact that I won't give away too much, but what she ends up going along with and how far she ends up going, you kind of got to know that this is someone who suffered a tragedy and has in a way been sort of like in a flight from that and is, you know, sort of uses art as an escape, uses love as an escape, has this kind of like almost yeah. manic anti-death energy about oh, her. Loved it, yeah. And I love that too. And I, I think as artists, we kind of relate. Like sometimes there's a little darkness in us that we're trying to keep away from. Um, and I don't know I, what I, you're talking about. Speak for yourself. I, I, <laughs> and so, you know, I think it, it expl- you know, a lot of people could stand back and be like, why would she put up with this? Why, you know, except that we all have our crazy and we all have, you know, a fantasy that as crazy it is and as off as it seems may actually satisfy something in us. Especially when we're like 25. Especially when we're 25. And then we were- Duncan though. I mean, I think you did a very beautiful job with the perspective switches and like the way that Duncan is such a villain and yet not a villain. Like, you know, we're with him. We're kind of on his side. It's unsettling. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, well, it's just, you know, it's a very different- project when you decide to deal with somebody who's really evil or whatever this would mean right but but you you do a really good job showing that even though he does evil things Mm -hmm. like every step along the way he's a total human being he's just like making the wrong choices yeah and that's so profound he's not a psycho he's He's a confused fucked up guy making really bad choices (laughs) haven't we all (laughs) For real. Yeah. I mean, and the youth is baked into it. Like, as you said, this kind of crazy is, is youthful crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. If they were 50, this would read real different. It would be, it would really be gross. (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, there's a kind well, old of- people are gross anyway. So no, I love old people. Yeah. I, I write, I write a lot about, you know, people close, close to my age, which is not twenties. Um, but this is, there is something about, you know, one's twenties and, and the ways in which you're kind of imbalanced and don't, yeah. and you're, you're reaching for things that are actually grandiose. Um, yeah. that you have to discover are grandiose. Life has to sort of beat the shit out of you. Right. Like, sooner or later. Or you, yes, that is how you discover. <laughs> um, also, you're, your frontal lobe is not fully developed or like just oh, barely? I think just barely. And just you know, barely, it's like a brand new lobe of your brain. You I don't know. know how to operate it yet. <laughs> that first love too, before you sort of parted from the per- someone and like loved again, you just feel like you're going to die. If you split up. Oh my God. Right? Yeah. Later, later we know we're not gonna die. Mm. Maybe we don't. But you know, I think I think there's something about the sort of the urgency, the tenor of it, the, yeah. the, the internal pace that kind of gets externalized that is and no after. perspective. No perspective. Yes, I'm very few obligations to keep you. <laughs> perspective is useful the problem is by the time you have perspective you're too old and tired and achy to like make use of it oh you're doing fine you just do oh youth is wasted on the young it's true it is true and they don't even know it (laughs) Hmm? it's also very tiring to go go through all of that i don't know if i want no no you have to be young to like waste all that energy and like create drama you know i know and normally i don't wouldn't think that young people are so interesting to even write about but i think this this element um of them is fun to write about everybody's good to write about in theory or everybody's boring to write about i don't know like there's there's you can like write something amazing about anyone at any age or write something turgid boring and Sure. And insightful. I guess I've just come to appreciate accumulated experience in people. It's true. There's it's true. Like the heft of a person. It's true. Yeah. I mean, it gets harder and harder as you get older to like find mentorship, but you always need it, you know? And it's like the rare young person who's got, you know, enough perspective or depth or, or context to actually offer that not to be ageist but that's one of the nice things about being young isn't it like you have so many options of like guides and role models and mentors and you can sort of experiment with you know who you want to go to for wisdom or I think that always ends badly (laughs) it does oh it does of course it does but that's part of the experience I guess that's part of the experience yeah anyway did you want to ask me about the intersection of, of psychoanalysis at all? Because I know that there was something. Yeah, I would love to. Whatever you want to share. I don't know if it's like a compartmentalized life. Um, oh, no, I don't think so. Um, well, it was interesting because I was in training. I, you know, I wrote most of this probably early on in training, but I, I did some revising when I was in it. And I also think that reading a lot of psychoanalytic literature gave me... Um, give me at least a different set of sort of uh, mechanisms or models for thinking about some of the same issues that are here. Um, And I, I'm writing my sort of graduating thesis or whatever you call it um, on love and blindness. I just got really interested in what psychoanalysis has to say about why we are such bad judges when we're in love. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why we're bad judges. And so, I mean, some of it comes down to just brain function and what parts of the brain are still oh, pheromones. Also, but it's not, it's not only that. I mean, psychoanalysis would, you know, it, it also has a lot to do with what are the fantasies that are animating us? What are our relationship histories and how sort of unconscious a lot of those really primitive sort of like needs and fantasies are and that they're getting really activated and they're really out of out of view so you know freud's notion and there are plenty other people that add to it but his notion is basically you know that you're you're being driven 
whatever you think you're being driven by is not <laughs> the thing. What you're being driven by has to be unconscious and it's some resemblance to your original love, which is what a parental figure or whatever. And then later people compliment, you know, compliment that theory and also come up with um, different ideas about it, including how much to preserve our early relationships, meaning parents, whatever, um, we don't allow ourselves to see. So that in a way that like blindness is baked into loving, because if we really see totally. everything, it's gonna totally. do right the bond. Amazing. So we split off. Right. And I just gotten really interested in this because I just feel like it's everywhere. Yeah. And you know, and also we may want to we may want to gratify a wish from a person that we don't even know we're after. And so we make that person mentally the person that can grant that wish. And and they're not. They're just they're just a guy, they're just a girl, right? So uh, yeah, I think it was it was really interesting to explore that kind of um, theoretically and at the same time write about it fictionally, which is a much more intuitive way of, of kind of getting at the same concepts. I agree. I agree. I, I would rather read a story that illuminates these ideas any day over a nonfiction treatise, but I agree with you. That's just me. And there's a richness mm -hmm. in the specificity, but the theory does kind of clarify certain things. It can, I mean, and it can like settle debates. It can like prove or like lay out evidence or offer, you know, proof, but still it doesn't have the same power as narrative for me. I agree. For and also when you're, when you're doing clinical work, you're always coming back to actual people and actual people right. will always confound theory. <laughs> right, right, right. It's so infinitely complicated that it, there's no simple story. Right. I mean, right. it can sound so reductive in theory, but no one is no one is simple. Nobody's just looking for their mom. Right. You know? right. <laughs> so, but you know, yeah. both both working with patients and reading that stuff and writing it, it is so much about character. Mm -hmm. Just trying to figure out the puzzle of a person. Yeah. Why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. Goes into making us who we are. But then once you figured that out or, or begun to piece it together how like what how do you make the leap to then like helping them or is the is the sort of like finding the answers and like piecing it together therapeutic in its own right I think it is I think you kind of do it together I mean it's not the whole story but maybe because I like narrative and I I, I think we weave narratives to understand ourselves whether they're they're always partial but I think there's something we don't really do yeah what that's the Joan Didion line, everybody parrots all the time, whether or not they've actually read any other Joan Didion, but we tell ourselves stories in order to live. We yeah, do. and I think you can expand people's stories, you can complicate their stories, you can create stories that include more of what they're actually experiencing. But we choose the stories we tell also. I mean, there's some incontrovertible facts about our lives, but we choose like the spin. We choose how to look at it. This is true. And then we build so much on those like rickety, questionable foundations. I do think the ricketiness starts to show though, especially when you really interact with somebody and you're like, oh, this is a story you tell about yourself. Well, funny, because totally. we're not experiencing totally. it at all, right? right? <laughs> and then like doubling down on that story and like again and again and again and again. And it's just, it becomes like a bizarro hamster wheel and nobody is. It's taking apart stories because we, we can hide from the truth with them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm totally a lot of intersection I think in in both kinds of work mm -hmm. yeah I mean there's like the, the, the like Rashomon effect too like the same event you can tell endless stories about nobody's ever going to experience the same thing the same way that's fascinating yeah well it's also part of the fun of having dual perspectives mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, Doug yeah. and Gina are, are sharing a story, but they're having actually very different experiences. Yeah, I love the way you did that. Very skillful, very deft. It's always fun. You know, it's tricky because you don't want to repeat. It just, I mean, you could, I guess. I mean, I'm trying to always give different information, but just enough overlap so that you realize, you know, you get a different sort of spin or insight of something that was presented in a mm -hmm. certain way by one character, and then you realize how much the other mm -hmm. sees it differently or how off they were in their perceptions. Right. Right. We get yeah. to feel clever. Of course, we're like much more like the dupes. They don't know the story <laughs> in real life. 
I really loved it. And I really loved, I loved being transported into the space of the past where everybody wasn't hyper-connected. Oh, God. You know, that's a huge element here that I think is just, it's, it, it reads very profound. I mean, I suppose we could go back and read books from the 90s and have that same experience or the 80s or any time in history before now, but uh, yeah, reading a contemporary novel that doesn't rely on texting and social media and yeah, it's kind of a relief in a way. Well, I found nostalgia for that period. I don't, I don't know if you do. And there's something about traveling and in, in, I'm a little older than you, but you know, traveling during that period, um, it was a very different experience. It was yeah. more untethered. It was wilder. Yeah. And also the idea of being present to somebody mm-hmm. um, without any distraction, without any social media. I mean, we don't even know what it's like. Everyone's always looking at their phone. You know, I'm, I'm the same. We're all the same. We may we're be all, traveling. I'm well right? in it. Like, we're all deeply in it. And it wasn't even that long ago. No, it really wasn't. Where like, if you wanted to like take a break from something or you were standing in line was for something or you had like two minutes to kill in repose, like you didn't pull out your phone immediately. But I don't even remember it. I, I honestly, it's like been wiped away. I know, well, writing this was fun in a way because I think it brought it back. And I do, I do somewhat remember just how difficult it was to communicate and, mm-hmm. um, I think the experience of time was different. We weren't trying to squeeze contact out of every minute. It's what you're saying. You have more space for reverie. You have also more space for terror. Like I had my passport stolen in Russia. That was horrifying. You know, it's, it was a different wow. time. And, you know, trying to just contact people or call. I mean, you couldn't just pick up your phone and, you know, it, it was just a very different um, experience traveling. But I, I found it really fun to go back and inhabit that again. Yeah, it was it was a it was a great escape. I mean, it was a, this book is an escape on many levels. It's it's suspenseful. It's like thickly richly plotted and it but it also gives you that time back of like you don't you don't have all the options in the world. You don't get to accomplish 50 things with like a few little taps. Right. You know. Absolutely. You actually, you have to interact more. You have to like think on your feet a little more. You have to like look around a little more, observe outside, you know, yeah. your own. Yeah, you know. I agree. I agree. It's also a weird experience because I don't think of myself as having lived through history, but actually I have because that is a different world. It's seismic. I know. And it, we're never going back. It's, I mean, it's that world is vanished. It's, it's as vanished as like pre language you know it's like pre-printing press pre-industrial whatever I mean I know our kids what about the children if only Um, they could get emotionally kidnapped somewhere (laughs) this you know this kind of story could take you you could write this story in a contemporary setting and just have Duncan doing all kinds of contortions to don't they have then you have to do then it all becomes about losing the phones it's like Mm -hmm. everything becomes like where's the phone where's Mm -hmm. the and then you have you have like where's my phone app you have like you know the phone has a phone GPS and then who wants a whole book that's just like and then the phone fell again (laughs) the horizon store was closed like I don't know I don't know how people do it now. I think it would be enormously complicated and difficult. Well, luckily you don't have to worry about that because you're done with this book and it's perfect. And yeah. Thank you. Well done. Um, It looks like we should let our audience ask us questions. Okay. Anybody have any questions? You know you do. Even if they're not directly related, we'll try our best to answer them. Or Robin will. <laughs> you can answer some. <laughs> Come on, what do you got? So I, I, there are no uh, questions posted in there yet. Okay. Um, but one question I had for, for both of you um, is thinking about the question of how much do you give your characters your experiences? Mm-hmm. Um, to what degree are they representations of you um and to how how much do they live on their own Mm -hmm. 
and how much can you can you almost like have some catharsis with characters versus that pushing a, a line that's a little too far? It's a great question. Thank that's like to hear from you. That's the question, really. Me first? Yeah. All right. Your your it's your night. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, it's a it's a sort of a Frankenstein proposition. Uh, you know, you raid the graveyard and you and you uh, you dig up whatever bodies you can, and you find whatever limbs on those bodies serve your purposes, and you know you stitch them together in your crazy laboratory and uh, animate them via some metaphysical process that cannot here be disclosed and it lumbers to life and you're like, holy shit, what the fuck is this? And then you have to like train it like a puppy, you know? <laughs> and you have to like socialize it and you have to like, um, and it's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a beloved relative or child or pet or I don't know. Of course you put so much of yourself into it, but like, it, it's, it's not, you know, it's not holding up a mirror and like, you know, describing what you see. It's, it's more like unearthing rotted pieces of carcasses long buried and hidden in the forest. I don't know. Uh, catharsis. Yes. I would say yes. If there's no catharsis for the writer, I think it's hard for there to be value for the reader. Um, and in order for there to be catharsis for the writer, the work has to be doing something that's really difficult and risky and and tender and you know hot to the touch. You know what I mean? That's my take. Yeah, Robin, what do you think? Yeah, um, I like her answer. I, I I will say in my own. You know, I also remember reading Elisa in school and there was always, you know, her writing um, for me had such personality and, and such a strong voice. And I was a little bit different in the fact that I, I felt like I wrote from a more distanced perspective. There was kind of more of a, more of a remove, more, um, I don't know, I imagined myself like a Tolstoy or someone where like everywhere and nowhere. Um, <laughs> and... I think as I've gotten older and a little more experienced, I've moved closer to me. And this, I think this book is in between. You know, I, there are also the ethics involved in sometimes writing really, really close to one's own experience. I, I, I What's that word? What's that word you used? Ethics, I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look that up. Hold they on. don't know that one. <laughs> but I have, I have felt twinges when it came to, um, exposing people or getting really close, close to um, real lived experience with people. So that I sort of, I feel like what I do is it's very much a fictional story, but, but the essence, the core has got to be an issue that I've grappled with. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise it's dead and why would I bother? Why would I, you know, so if it, if, this is a very crazy story, but you know, what's not crazy is getting carried away in love you know, losing your bearings as a young person, um, wanting to go back and undo damage that you have wrought and, and sort of, you know, live a fantasy of what if we never broke up? What if that bad thing never happened? You know, there are a lot of things that feel very actually close to home. Uh, but then I put it in sort of this mm -hmm. fantasy. Um, and then I've started doing stuff which is closer to me, but um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it yet because none of that has gotten out into the world. Do you, remember, just, oh, sorry. do you remember, there's this great line in Laurie Moore's classic story, How to Be a Writer from 1984, her collection Self-Help, which was huge influence on me as a young person. Uh, you know, she says fiction is like um, recombinant DNA. You take a strand from reality and you put it in a different context and then it lives a life of its own. That's like totally, you know, can't be traced back really um, to reality. One kind of follow-up question. I love that metaphor. It's uh, kind of taking a little piece and, and letting it live somewhere else. Um, thinking about how much control as the author you have over the, the takeaway, um, like when you, when you are you in relation to the reader, um, do you go in with an intention? 
and say, this is, this is some kind of grand takeaway for you? Um, or does that strand simply replicate at, at wild? You first. Um, I think that this, this particular book, because it is certain, like there are certain twists and certain facts of the matter. My first book was so ambiguous that people tripped all over it because I really didn't want to tie anything up and I really didn't want to tell the reader what to think. And then readers were a little bit like, what? So here, I think I, I clarified some more. There's, you know, the facts, but I will say the, the only takeaway that I really have is to just really raise questions and to foreclose easy judgments. I don't ever want someone to feel like it's obvious that so-and-so was bad and obvious that so-and-so is good. And any, any sort of um, anything that feels morally simplistic or kind of the reader should not end up thinking what they thought about the person in the beginning at the end. That's very important to me. And they should actually question their own thoughts about what their assumptions were along the way. So that's kind of a takeaway, but it, in some ways, maybe it's the opposite of a takeaway. Like I'm taking away their assumptions. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I co-sign that. It's true. <laughs> like a, a story should be a liminal space. Like in, in our lives, we have so many judgments. We like people, we dislike people. We have snap judgments. We're walking around all day, projecting our shit everywhere, telling ourselves stories about this one, that one, you know? And in a story, it's such a nice suspension of reality in that way. Like, can you empathize in a story with someone who, if you ran into them in a parking lot, you would hate on site for no reason because of your own biases and weirdnesses and bullshit. Um, but I also think like, a, a, like it's, it's theatrical and novels has to be like a, it's like a stage and you're the marionette, you're, you're not to, I, that reminds me of Violet and her amazing theater in Prague, which I was so into, um, but you're animating all these people on, on the stage of your, of your story. And of course you have a worldview, every playwright, every, every dramatist has, has a worldview that sort of of shaping the way they're choosing to tell a story and that's good and we just need all different ones you know we don't need one worldview that's ooh, ooh, sorry um we need you know we all but we all we and we I think it's pointless for us to pretend that we don't have a worldview like the the the, the heat is in sort of uh, unpeeling the layers of like, what, what is this worldview and why? And like, can I shift it a few degrees this way or that way? What's unyielding? What's maybe open to change? Um, that's good stuff. Can I have a follow up to her comment? <laughs> so, I, what I also think is that fiction, and I'm sure you'd agree, fiction has this life of its own, right? So, you know, I think you know, to bring back Tolstoy and Anna Karenina, I believe was written with a certain agenda to mm. condemn adultery, to sort of point out like, you know, it's almost like a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. This is not yeah. how I read it. You're is supposed to go for different? the guy who's like Levin and not for the guy who's like right. Bronte. Like, don't go for the it's flash like a big track. message to women. Just like, okay, he's a little dumb. Good but stuff. Like he'll important. Make That's an important it. message. I know, but that was so not my experience reading it. Like I was so enamored of Anna and I was just so pissed at Franz. So in a way, I feel like, you know, the this is nothing new, but the, the author's intention can really break loose. If you're, if you're a really good artist, you don't know which character is gonna end up the most lovable to your reader. I mean, in, in the last book I wrote, the meanest character I had was the one that everybody ended up, you know, most excited about. And, and you know, I, so, there is also that element where I think you can't be too in control. You might have an agenda, but your your own work should kind of screw with your agenda. <laughs> but can we, are, it, like, it, has the statute of limitations on your NDA expired yet on Roth? Can we talk about Roth? Know. He's been dead for a few years now. <laughs> um, well, we better anyway. say now or people are going to infer that more happened. <laughs> Robin, Robin was, was an associate of Philip Roth's for a time when we were young. Um, and, uh, you did some work for him, right? You yeah. like, yeah. Sent letters on his, behalf. um, yeah. And, uh, his work, his work, which was so fundamental to me, um, suggests like the exact opposite, but he's one of very few people who can pull that off. I think, 
I mean, his voice is kind of like just nail the ear. Yes, like hammer and a nail. Like his, he, yeah, his allegiances, alliances, worldviews, like on certain characters, like. I just have such mixed feelings about that experience because you feel, you feel kind of mentally colonized. But he's brilliant and it's a mix of things. Yeah, I guess if you're going to be mentally colonized, you want it to be really good. <laughs> no <laughs> mediocre mental colonization. Totally agree. <laughs> um, we have a really good lesson. question. Yeah, I got it. We have a good question here from Anonymous. Uh, what is the experience like when your novel that's been in your head for so long suddenly hits all the hearts and minds of thousands of people and they react to it? Well, I'm still waiting for that moment. I think it is with the hearts and minds of dozens of people. Dozens. A <laughs> <laughs> um, hundred. Okay, a hundred. I, I think it's a little unsettling because you also just never know who your readers are going to be and how they're going to mm -hmm. take it. And there is, um, I don't know, you you speak to this too, Lisa. I think, you know, every now and then you, you come across a reader who, who really kind of gets it the way you wanted it. And... Um, or makes you feel good or maybe even see something in the book uh, that you that you didn't see yourself and that can be wonderful but I think as often as not you get people who are kind of expecting something else or somewhat somewhat dismissive or coming with their own speaking of agenda right and then and and you can feel kind of um, misread in a way so it, it's really a mixture um, you definitely feel vulnerable. I, I do. I, I don't, I don't take this stuff lightly. I, I feel, I don't have a very thick skin. So um, yeah, I guess I feel a little bit exposed, but it's also really nice to share work with. Kind of better than the alternative, you know? Yeah. And, and knowing you can't control it, I think it takes a long time. It's taken me a long time to just be like, whatever, like love it, hate it, don't care. Fine. You know, it's like, I can't do anything about any of those things. And I can't get all hyped up when somebody's like, you're a genius, the way I can't get all dejected when somebody's like, you should rot in hell. It's like, whatever, whatever it is, it's fine. <laughs> what? I said, I got that reviewer too. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> what? What happened? No, on the last one. Oh. There was a oh. rot in hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, people have different needs when they approach a book and different, they're coming from different places and they're projecting different things. And, you know, I, I think if you feel really good as a writer about your work, about what you put into it, like you got the words right, you fulfilled your intentions, you, you know, uh, you did what you intended to do, what you set out to do. Um, then when it's published, you sort of wish it well. Um, and you don't wait for a verdict, you know, cause it's irrelevant, you know, um, if you did your work, if you, if you, if you pooped it out, uh, or you're like a mercenary and you were sort of like, oh, maybe people will like this and they don't then. Okay. Like you could feel shitty, but if you're fulfilling something, you know, personal, internal, authentic, then whatever it is, it is, I don't know. It's taken me a long time. Yeah, she's cooler than me. She's she's had more things out. In the it's world. taken me a long time. When my first book <laughs> came out, when my like short story collection, my debut came out, and I just thought like, oh, I'm so special now. My life's gonna change, and everything's gonna be so. And it's like, you know, uh, I was like devastated. I was like lying awake at night, like, how dare they? You know, um, it's just like not cute. And it's like you go through that a little less, I think, every time. Um, this is true. Yeah. Well, this time, now it's time to go buy this book for everybody who's watching this Yay. now. Um, the End of Getting Lost. Uh, you can buy it on Literati's website or in person. There it is. Um, go ahead and buy it and let everybody know what you think. It's and cool. thank you, Robin and Elisa. This has been an honor to just sit in on this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. For hosting Robin, I'll that catch you later. Much fun. <laughs> All right. See you. Yeah. Alrighty. Good night, y'all. Have a good one.